about the new self and what it means that, let me see if we can get this going here, what it means that we have been set free. Let me read you an article out of a, out of a popular magazine. This is from March 26, 2007. With every step into the overgrown thicket, May Miller's breathing became more labored. My heart is beating so fast, she says. I can't believe I'm back here. It's not the unsteady footing in the field of Gillsburg, Mississippi that gives her pause. It's the memories. Some 50 years ago, Miller says she and her parents, Kane and Leela Wall, and her six siblings were held like slaves on this land and the surrounding farms. We've been through pure hell, she says here. I mean hell right here on earth. The story that Miller, now 63, and her relatives tell is a nightmare straight out of the old self. Out old self, south. For years, she says the family was forced to pick cotton, clean houses, and milk cows, all without being paid, under threat of whippings, rape, and even death. They say they were passed from white family to white family, their condition never improving, until finally hope that life uh, would never would ever get better was nearly lost. Technically, the walls were victims of penish which is an illegal practice that, flo that flourished in the rural South after slavery was abolished in 1865 and lasted in isolated cases like theirs until as recently as the 1960s. Under peonage, blacks were forced to work off debts, real or imagined, with free labor under the same type of violent coercion as slavery. In contrast with the more common arrangement known as sharecropping, peons weren't paid and couldn't move from the land without permission. White people had the power to hold blacks down, and they weren't afraid to use it, and they were brutal, says Pete Daniel, a historian at the Smithsonian Institute. So can you believe that 80 years after, after 80 years there was still slavery and a brutal taskmaster in the home right here of America, in the home of the free and the brave? See, people still lived as slaves. The fact was the 13th Amendment had made them free. The 14th Amendment had given them rights as a free man, and finally they were brought back under the original intent of the Declaration of Independence, which gives all people the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet, people, many people, still lived as slaves. The deception in peonage is the same tool that the enemy uses, the taskmaster, the taskmaster uses with us today. First, he hides the truth or masks the truth, sometimes by mixing truth with a lie. And you can see how that was done there. Oh yeah, you're free, but you have all these debts that you have to work off. So therefore you have to stay on in this manner. Second, the person that is receiving that lie places their confidence in that lie. They believe the lie. And then third, they start to live out that lie and thus present themselves as a slave to that lie or a slave to the person that brought that lie. Yet our father, our, our papa, has a system to bring us into the fullness of life. Life that originates within the Trinity family and is poured into each of us that will receive what he desires to give. We've always had a sense that there was a good God, I believe. And, and, but deception on many levels, whether it is from the world or from religion, will blind us to the fact of His goodness. He offers us Himself, and yet we try to systemize it. I, I remember this scene from the, the movie The Matrix that, that kind of spoke to me when I was thinking about this, this red pill and blue pill scene. And I was going to describe it to you, but... Thank God for YouTube, so I found the clip of it on there. <laughs> Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. But you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with it. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Like a splinter in your mind. Driving you mad. It is this feeling. The man. 
matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave in you, like everyone else you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and leave. Whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Look at that light if you want, Charlie. See, we have a choice. We have a red pill or blue pill. We've, we've known about this God that is good and that can set us free. And yet so many of us will run to that and we get back involved in a system that brings us into a different kind of bondage a different kind of slavery. See, He has come to give us life. We, we don't dispute that, it's just we rename that life. We mix that with a little bit of a lie and instead of being set free, we call our new prison freedom. So what has to happen is we must know the truth. Another word in the Greek for truth is reality. We must know what reality is. Second, we must believe and receive that which is real, that which is true. It's one thing to know about it, it's another thing to believe it. And I, I almost have to b say believe and receive, because so many times we say, well, believe is just an intellectual assent. Well, that's just knowing about. Receiving it is receiving it into, into yourself. Kind of like when he swallowed that red pill, that's receiving. And then finally, we begin to live out of the reality that is set before us. We present ourselves as fully confident in what he has said. Going back to that story of Pinage and the Taskmaster, this is a picture, a cartoon from the early 30s that depicted this, that had, was going on still in the South back then. If you're still living like a slave, even though slavery's been nullified under the changing of law, then each person must first know that the 13th Amendment has set them free. It is a fact, it's the law of the land, that is reality. But see, that doesn't subjectively change anything for the person that knows about it. It's one thing to know about that. It doesn't change anything. They must personally believe it, place their confidence in the fact that they are free and to receive that freedom into themselves. And then there's a final step. The final step is living as if that's true. Living as if that is reality. If this doesn't happen, it really does no good for them. It really does nothing. You can believe and receive that truth and still live as a slave. The next part is believing it, receiving it, and then starting to live as if that is very true. For most of us, and for many of us, it's become theory. And, had, and, and the Bible and Christianity and all of the finished work of Jesus has really had no impact in any meaningful way in our lives. We know that we are saved, but yet we're still under that bondage. Let me show you how this works with with a word. We'll take one word. Let's take the word faith. Okay, Where does faith originate? See, so many times if we don't understand, we don't know the truth, that faith doesn't originate with us. It originates with God. Then we begin to be self-focused. One camp tries to emotionally charge up themselves to work up faith. The other camp kind of just, well, you know, I'm not real sure about it, so we'll ignore it. We'll, we'll walk by sight. But that's not faith. In, in fact, the Bible is so implicit on faith, it says the just, the righteous people, will live by faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. We move from faith to faith, and it, and it devotes a whole chapter on what faith is. 
One chapter on faith, one chapter on love. That's the only two words in the whole New Testament are devoted one complete chapter to. And yet we look over and say, oh, faith's not that important. Or it becomes so self-focused that we believe faith comes from us that we'll have to work it up. Let me show you um, a couple of verses on faith. And I'm going to show you out of two different Bible translations. Because what happens in some Bible translations is they will read into it. So if I'm translating the Bible and I believe that faith originates with us, then I'm not going to put it as, as what the Word says. I'm going to add a word into there. So even in King James, let's go to the King James Bible here, which I generally like. It says, Hebrews 12, 2, Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There's a word there, our. It's in italics. The reason why that word is in italics, and at least I give the King James credit for this, if the word isn't in the original Greek, they at least italicized it. The italicized words just mean, well, this will help it make sense to you. But what happens is when you remove that word, it becomes more clear. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. It's not our faith, it just has of faith. I like how this one translation translated the, uh, the same verse. It says, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the originator, which is what author means, the originator and perfecter of faith. See, if I believe the lie that faith is from me or originates with me, then I'll be self-focused and never have enough faith. It'll always be my fault that, it, that something didn't go right. And if I would have just had more faith, and I'll have people, well-meaning people come beside me and say, well, how's your faith? And now what happens is my eyes, instead of looking up to the Savior, become self-focused and say, well, I guess I could have had more faith. Well, I just need to work up more faith. Well, did you read your Bible enough? Maybe that's why you don't have enough faith. Or did you get up at 5 a.m.? I remember Luther used to get up at 5 a.m. to pray for three hours. I mean, that, maybe that'll work for you. Then you can get faith. And the whole time I'm getting up for three, at three or 5 o'clock in the morning and praying for three hours so that I can get this faith. It's a quid pro quo. If I do this, God, you've got to give me this. Well, the whole time God's not going to do that because I'm believing a lie that faith doesn't, or, that faith doesn't originate with Him. It originates with me. But see, once I come to understand of this faith that dwells inside me, that originates with God, it dwells in me, right? Because it comes from God. And I've been born of God. Now Christ himself has united himself with my spirit. The Holy Spirit now lives inside me. I begin to believe that Christ is the author or the originator and perfecter of faith. Which lines up perfectly with what that verse says. I be, and then I begin to live as if it's true. And I think that's the next step. I can understand all of the other stuff and then not to live as if it's true. Because I, I got used to living the other way for so long looking at my own faith or making sure I could work up enough faith. But now I've got to start to present myself as if it's true. I'm no longer looking from, at me to drum up faith or to evoke some kind of faith dance that, so that I'll feel faith. I don't feel condemned or guilty because my faith has failed. Instead, I begin to look to God Himself to bring me this faith by trusting the One that lives inside me. This starts to train my ear to listen to the Word. Not, not the Bible, not, not the Logos, but the Rhema. To listen to what God, that, there's a difference in that. God will speak. I begin to listen to what Christ is saying to me. And, and those other voices that I had learned to train my ear to so long, those, those experts of the law, well, they start to fade into the background as I get to hear from Christ Himself by the Rhema, the Word of Christ inside my heart. And I learn to, to trust His words. And then, here's the beauty, I begin to live in the reality of what Christ said. He said, my sheep will hear my voice. And my ear begins to be changed the more that I'm training in godliness, as, as it would say. Training in godliness is just learning to walk with God. That's really what that, that is turning. Because I was training in ungodliness before. I walked many days without God. Now I'm learning to train in godliness. Okay, God, you're with me. I can trust the faith that's inside me. Now, with this in mind, I'm going to use the same model to go through a couple other things. We'll pick up a little bit from last week. Um, and there's three points I want to make today. Three truths that we must know, believe, and live out of. We must know that we have died. That that is a past tense event. Just like prior to coming to salvation, you must know that Christ has died. 
We must know that we have died. And we're talking to save people. As, as Billy put it earlier, we're equipping the church to go out and do the ministry. As Bob is going out and reaching out to, to this lady in the Ukraine and her son. That's where ministry takes place. This is just an equipping place. This is an encouragement and we should leave feeling better and, 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 and feeling greater and more equipped to now do the things that God has us do, each in our individual lives. That's where in the ministry takes place. We also, also know that we are new. That we're made new. We're a new creation in Christ. Not that we will be made new, but that we have been made new. That it is a done deal. And a couple of these verses I'm going to talk about in Colossians 3.3, 3, 2 Corinthians 5.17. They're going to be in the, in the verses coming up. And then here's another one. We must know, trust, believe, and present ourselves that we can do all things in Christ. Some, some of the translations will say through. The word in there is in, E-N. In Christ who enables us to do all things. Last week we, we were talking about Romans um, 7 and how that becomes the mantra for a lot of people's normal Christian life. You know, the good that I don't do is not, uh, the good that I want to do is not what I do, it's the evil that I don't want to do. Uh, for I do not know the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I don't do, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So we end right there because experientially that kind of tends to line up with our life. And we say, well, that must be the normal Christian life. Paul said that was the normal Christian life. And we'll take that verse out of context because it lines up with our experience and say that is what Christianity is all about without putting it into the context of the whole letter. Now, let's look at this. There is therefore now no condemnation, Romans 8.1, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, good. Well, I know even when I'm failing, there's no condemnation. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free, past tense, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And, and you're like, well, that doesn't line up. So we try to figure a way because in my experiences, that doesn't generally line up with, with what I'm experiencing the Christian life to be. So we try to figure out, well, how can the Christian life be this and this? So we said, well, I'm going to focus more on Romans 7 because that's really the normal Christian life. The problem is if I go to the prior verses in Romans 7, it says the same thing that it says in Romans 8. Romans 7, 5, it says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died, past tense, to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. It, this having died is not just in one verse of the Bible. I can give you 30 verses that it's in. We have died. That is a past tense event. Now, we don't know how to receive that or believe that. And we also don't know how to walk that out. Because that's where this equipping time comes in. And we begin to share what walking in this faith looks like. I think many of only hold on to part of us having died. As a kind of a knowing. It's a kind of like a fairy tale that we know is real, but it really doesn't impact our normal life. It has never moved from the knowing to believing. Or for some, we not only know... But we now truly believe that we have died. Yet we don't know what this looks like, like and how this can impact our daily living. See, my old self, the old man that wanted and desired things apart from Christ, has perished. And the haunting of it is just that. It's a haunting. Any way or any time I go to get my needs met, real or imagined, apart from Christ, it's a lie. Because we have been united as one spirit with Him. There in the spiritual warfare takes place. The enemy comes with his fiery darts to say, that's not you, you're really still that old self. Look at you, you can't get yourself together. And you give ear to that voice. And you start to bring power and give power to that to say, well that's true, it's not me. That I am this old self. And as soon as he hooks you with that lie, you begin to believe that lie and start to live out of that lie. Just like in Penis, right? They, they begin to, oh well, okay, I'm free. I'm going to mix that freedom with a little truth. What, what the... What they would do is they would say, yes, yes, the 13th Amendment has made you free. And even the 14th has given you rights as, as for personhood. You're not a slave, but... Because remember, they weren't educated, they were ignorant. You still owe this much money. And you can't go in, and live in your freedom until you pay back this. Now, there's a way that I've made for you to pay this back. It's called sharecropping right now. We'll share in, the, in, in this land. I'll let you work it off. I'm going to be your friend. I'll let you work off this debt that you have to me. Well, they, they weren't accountants. They didn't know. 
They were ignorant of the fact. So what the, the, the taskmaster, the evil taskmaster would come in and say, wow, we had a great crop. Yeah, but you know, the seed was actually a little bit more and this was a little bit more so. Yeah, the, the, the debt went down a little bit, but you still owe. So maybe next season you'll work some more of it off. And next season, what happens is generationally, 80 years is a generation, their children are born and they're brought into this slavery. And they're brought really into slavery even though they know that they've been set free. And, and what happens with that is we begin to not understand what freedom looks like or we... We, we take and we redefine freedom. Yes, this is what freedom is. It's working under the taskmaster so that I, I, I guess I'm feeling free because I know I'm free, but I've got to get this part done and ultimately one day I'll be free. But the lie continues. It's, the lie is always a lie. When you mix truth, even if it's 97% truth with 3% of a lie, it's still not the truth. It, it's like how much rat poison is in rat poison? You guys know? How much poison is actually in there? Actually, I think that's right. It's, it's like 99% fillers and, and like just point something of poison. So the filler is there for the rat to be enticed to take it. And as he starts to eat this and enjoy it, it begins to kill him from the inside out till he falls over dead. So it's very little poison. It's just a little bit of poison mixed with the good stuff becomes poison to the system. All right, so that's the spiritual warfare. He comes, the taskmaster, the evil one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy the life of Christ in us, convinces you that you're not new and that you're still that old self that you always have been. Even to the point of you saying, well, I, I guess I'll be new one of these days. Maybe when I get to heaven. Well, man, I can't wait till I get to heaven. Life here is drudgery. and uh, I, I know I'm saved. And you start to make these doctrines, these teachings that kind of experientially work together to... to to fence in this lie. And that's what happens. That becomes, a lot of that is the normal Christian life right now, which is an abnormal Christian life. And that's why Nee had to write the book, The Normal Christian Life, because so many of these things that were being spouted off in the 20s and 30s were that this is the normal Christian life. So Nee writes this book called The Normal Christian Life, redefining it, and everybody comes out and says, no, that can't be. That's not what our experiences have lined up to be. That, that's, that's the abnormal one. Well, it's time to actually be abnormal. The normal Christian life of what the Bible says is what we want, not the abnormal taskmaster life. All right, let me show you another verse in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4.20, it says, But that is not the way that you learned Christ, assuming that you heard... See that word about? Italics. It's because it's thinking, well, I have to hear about him. Again, that word is not there. Speaking, assuming that you have heard him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus... To put off your old self, which belongs to the former, former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. And funny, in, in, in verse 23, there's really no word for in in there. And kind of a better translation is by, by the spirit in your mind, or of your mind. To be renewed of the spirit that's inside. Your spirit begins to be renewed. Your soul, which is your, your will, your mind and emotions, begins to follow that spiritual leading. That's what it's talking about, being walking by the spirit. But the old self is our job to put that off. God says, I've made that old self, I've, I've crucified it with me. I've, it's done, it's a done deal. I've given you this new creation, you are new. Now put that on. Learn to walk by what it means to be new. One of the greatest lies takes place is that we're just the same as we before we came to Christ. Or actually, it would even go back that we that humanity is the same before Christ came. It's like, you know, Christ is a nice little Easter or Christmas story and then an Easter story and then we go on with our life. That's just a little blip in the, in the, in the whole story of humanity. No, that's the focal point. It's his story. That's history right there. And everything changed. There was a coming looking forward of, of, of this Messiah, of this Christ, and now we're looking back. Everything changed at that point, and we don't realize the power and the provision that God has placed for us that happened 2,000 years ago. That objectively has happened, and it starts to become ours subjectively as we believe it. And what the problem is, we believe that we're just the same as we were before, because we don't feel some great change. Even though we know we're different, we start to walk in the same manner, and then we begin to look to others to say, well, this is what it means to walk in the Christian life, and they're living in the bondage. And they bring us right back into that same bondage. I like what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, going on to the second point, which is, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. Not will be, not hopefully gets to be one of these days. That, that He is is a present tense. We need to, to not do the Bible reading programs. Like they say, you've know, you got to read your Bible in a year. Some of them say a month. I mean, if God's leading you to read the Bible in that program, then you go for it. But we need to just slow down a little bit and say, okay, what is this verse saying? If anyone is in Christ, is that me? Am I in Christ? Was I included in this, in this great, glorious resurrection? Yeah, I was. Well, then that means that I'm a new creation. That's a present tense reality of who I am. Now, what happened? The old has passed away. That's a done deal. It has passed away. Now, if you don't believe this or you don't believe this is true, then you'll go back to living under the taskmaster. And until you get tired enough under that system, you'll never receive these realities. Because it isn't until that wears you out and breaks you down that you finally say, ah, I'm done. For me, it was after a 40-day fast, and I, I'm going to get the victory for God, and I'm going to live in this high and holy life. And a, a number, a couple of days afterwards, I remember going right back into failure, right back into the same uh, pattern. And that was like, I tried everything else. The 40-day fast thing was like the, the supreme thing that I knew if I did that, you know, Moses and Christ did it, so therefore if I did it, I would have the victory. Needless to say, a few days later, the victory did not come. And I was completely at the end. I was completely wrecked. And I thought, this Christianity thing is a farce. And I took my Bible and I threw it across the bed and I said, this is a bunch of junk. It doesn't work. I'm done trying, God. You had it. I've done and I, I think that was at the point where God rejoiced. He said, ah, finally he repents from trying. Now he'll start to trust me that I can do it in him. And the angels in the choir said, thank you. For me, I thought I was like letting God down. But the, the reality and the spiritual reality of it was God can finally start to work and to will and to do his great pleasure in me. See, that was at my breaking point. So, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Present tense. It is here. It has come. Now you can go around and, and you can say, and you might hear this sometimes in, in churches, that, you know, I'm just a sorry old sinner saved by grace under the hands of a mad and angry God, a wrathful God, that, that I'm just a sorry old sinner. And it, it kind of sounds humble. Kind of sounds religious, you know, like, well, that guy's very humble. Look at him. He's, you know, looking down on himself. Therefore, that's how we define humility, which is not the definition. Anyway, but, that becomes a lot of the mantra. See, that is not the reality. That was a reality. That is what happened. But now something has happened that you came into Christ. You have been made new. You are new. You're not what you once were. You're something brand new. And even in saying that, again, it kind of sounds humble. See, the beauty of Christ is that He knew that, that we as humanity would be led down that direction to try to do these religious talks, these things that, that, that would that we would do in order to give us some victory. And he warns us of this in Colossians because he's going to say, look, Paul's saying to the church there, you're going to, this is going to happen. You're going to try to walk down this road and it's going to sound real good, but it's really not any, there's no power in it. It says in Colossians 2.20, he says, if, Christ, if with Christ, or really the word if could be since, since with Christ you died, past tense, it has happened, it is a done deal, thank you very much. To the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you're still alive in this world, do you submit again to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human, not divine, precepts and teachings. He goes on to warn him in this one. He's like, look, these things have an indeed an appearance of wisdom. They're promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body means, look, you're going to look real humble. You're going to, I mean, there's points like even in the Philippines where you know, they want to, to have the severity where they'll whip their back and then hang themselves on a cross on Easter. Not, 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 I mean, they'll, they'll hang up there. They won't pierce their hands. I mean, that would be going a little too far right, for them, but even them. But they'll, they'll look to try to get the victory in that way. He says, look, they have indeed an appearance of wisdom, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. I learned that firsthand. For me, that was the day that I threw the Bible across the room because I realized they didn't have this 40-day thing didn't have any value in stopping this power, this great power inside me that wanted to still live independent of God because I had mixed the truth with a lie. All right. See, until we settle in our hearts that we are 
a present tense, new creation, not much else can be done. Not much else can be done for you until that is settled in your heart. And the only way to settle it is not through hearing more preaching and not through going to 16 different Bible conferences. It's learning to turn to God and say, what are you talking about here, Lord? You say, if I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation. I don't feel like it. Can you help me to make this real? Can you teach me? I mean, the conferences and the teaching, those, those, those reinforce. But when you get that word from God that you are, and He speaks it into your heart, that's what changes things. Not, not learning more. We have enough learning. Start taking what you've learned and bring it to God. Bring it right to the throne and say, I don't understand how this can happen. What does it mean I'm a new creation? I don't feel like it. Remember, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees about their inner filth, their hearts, their actions. It wasn't their outer cup. See, a lot of this Christian game we play is talking about more. It's really just moralism. It's, it, and it stems back to what the Pharisees were doing. They were living good and upright lives, but yet Jesus said, Look, you're self-righteous. Woe to you because you're not even doing those things. On the outside you look like you're good, but on the inside you still have these rotted bones. See... When you're a new creation, you're not on, on the inside. You change from the inside out instead of from the outside in. Christianity is about changing from the inside out. As my heart lines up with what God says I am and who He says I am, my desires start to change. Remember the verse in Psalms 34, and I might have the address wrong? It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and He gives you the desires of your heart. As I delight myself in the Lord my desires of my heart start to change. I begin to see people, as Paul said, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. My heart goes out to them in a different way. It doesn't come to satisfy the flesh. It comes through who I now am, which I'm Spirit. I begin to walk by the Spirit. My soul begins to express. My mind, will, and emotions begin to express who I truly am, and my body starts to move in that way. And I begin to be set free from the inside out. All right, let me remind you of the three points that we had earlier today. The three truths we must know believe, receive, and live out of. We must know that we have died. We must know that we're made a new creation in Christ. And we must know that we can do all things in Christ who enables us. See, our new self, our new self, what does that look like? We need to be trained to what it looks like to walk in this new self, to walk in the reality of who we are. What does my new creation self look like? I love that Suha did a, a sermon a few weeks back on the inheritance that, that we get to receive as part of being this new creation. Well, if I'm, not, if I'm not fully convinced in my heart and mind that I'm a new creation, how can I receive the inheritance that is made for a new creation? I begin to walk only as a pauper if I don't receive that. So, the new self is enabled to do all things in Christ. In Christ is a big statement right there. As Christ leads, as He guides, I'm able to do all things in Christ. He enables me to do them. I'm equipped. He's not going to ask me to do something that, that, I, that He hasn't equipped me to do. I'm equipped to do all these things in Christ who enables me. And here's the beauty. As a church, we're to encourage one another and to be encouraged by God Himself to do all things through Christ who enables me. See, the problem doesn't rest with God. The work was finished. It rests with us receiving all that is in Christ. And the receiving becomes difficult because we've been so used to living by this quid pro quo system that we have to do this to get that. Instead of just saying, Lord, you've said this is true, let me receive it and I'll live out of what you're giving me. What happens in my heart is I receive more, is my heart raises up in thankfulness. Remember, it's better to give than receive. Right? We remember that verse? Better to give than receive. Well, who is the standard of goodness? When Jesus said there's none good but God, so if the, it's better to give than receive, the giver, the greater, gives to the lesser. It's better for him to give than to receive. He gives, we receive, now we start to give, and other people start to receive. We give salt and light in this beauty of who Christ is in us. Loving the unlovables. Loving people as, as they, they act unlovable and, and, and push against these things. Well, because of Christ living in us, we can now love others when they are not, they are not acting in a loving way. Christ doesn't come to help us with our life. He comes to be our life. And there's a, I was on Friday... I was uh, listening to this uh, one teacher. He, he brought some stuff from a very prestigious teacher. And it sounded very flowery, very good. 
And one of the points on there was, if you do A, B, and C, then God will help you to do it. And everybody pretty much in the class was like, wow, this is really good stuff. And I raised my hand and I said, well, I've got to respectfully disagree. I said, this is teaching separation. God doesn't help me. He lives inside of me. He becomes me. It's Christ living in me. That was the mystery of the gospel. Yet we say, yeah, God will help me. And I'm here and God is here and there's a separation. And what happens is I start to do good and so God will help me. If I do bad, then I run away from God. God lives inside me, good, bad, or indifferent. He has united himself with me. So it's not that Christ will come to help me with my life. He comes to be our life. So many of us, all of us, have had an enemy. And many of us can say, well, I, I didn't know these truths. But now these things have been brought from the darkness to the light. Therefore, we can walk in the light as God has given us light on these things. We can walk in the inheritance that we have. We can say before, wow, I didn't realize that I had the spirit of love living inside of me. But now that I do, and I talk to God about it, and he's, He is un helping me to understand what that spirit of love looks like, now I can walk in this manner of, of the spirit of love. You know, I feel that there's so many of us, and myself included, especially at times now, but especially in the past, where I was so sufficient in myself I had no need for the Holy Spirit's enablement. I had no need that, that He would come. And I would say the words. And that's what was kind of looking back. I was doing a little reflecting the other day on it. I used to say, oh yes, I need the Holy Spirit's power and provision in my life. <laughs> Sounded good, but I didn't really believe it. And, and I honestly didn't walk like it either. I walked out of my own strength and my own power. I really didn't need God to do anything. It's like what the Chinese missionary said when he came to, uh, uh, to the, one of the mega churches here in, in this country, the guy said, well, well, what's impressed you most about, this, uh, about our United States and the church here? He says, oh, all the, guy, all the things you guys can do without the Holy Spirit's help. <laughs> and that, that was my life. I mean, I figured I'm going to go out and do it for God and end up hurting a lot of people and pushing religion down their throat. I think Moses... A good, a good example, as I was reflecting on it, was Moses in the Old Testament. So he gets the call to set his people free. And what's he do? He gets ramped up in his own abilities and his own strength. And he's going to do it in his power. And he ends up murdering a man. And he makes a mess. And he has to flee. And then he lives 40 years out in the desert. I believe each and every day Christ is showing them that he's not able, that Moses himself apart from Christ is not able, but Christ in him will be able. And then Moses has this divine light that happens, this burning bush, right? When God knew he was finally ready in, in, in Christ's sufficiency, and he could receive it and start to walk in it. And I like what Moses says. He says, well, I can't even speak. I, I can't even speak. So he's saying, I, I, I'm not sufficient in myself anymore. And finally, Moses goes. And he leads the people to freedom. He gets to that edge of the Red Sea. And if you know a little bit of the geography of it, every which way he was like in a funnel. right? And in this funnel, he could, there was only one way they could go, and that was to swim across that Red Sea. And they could never swim that distance. The Egyptian army is coming in. There's cliffs on this side. And there's nothing. They were done. In their own sufficiency, there was nothing they could do. And then that's when God says, Okay, I'm going to show you my sufficiency. And you can walk through mine. And I'll protect you even as you walk through it. I'll protect you from the water and the drowning. And your enemies that are coming after you. I'll protect you from them too. Now learn to trust me. Learn to walk in me. The funny thing is, is not that long later, uh, they send the 12 spies out. And 10 of them says, Oh, there's no way we can take those guys. They're big. I mean, we're, we're like grasshoppers to them. Yet Joshua and Caleb say, hey, with Christ we can do anything. With God, all things are possible. So two, learn to understand their, their, their non-sufficiency, but God's sufficiency. The ten were still walking. So God had to retrain them for 40 years, walking and providing for them their water, providing for them their meat, providing for them their manna, in the, and providing for them shoes that wouldn't wear out. And they learned to trust God. And then 40 years later, they got to walk into what their inheritance was. But it took them 40 years, just like it took Moses. 40 years sitting out in the desert. I pray it doesn't take us 40 years. I really do. Because it took me too, way too long. I, I suffered in the soup of this, this crazy religion, fighting against God, thinking I could do it. 
for way too long. And I, now I realize it has to be Him. I just become a willing vessel of it. So we've had a hard time believing many times that there really is no redeeming value for you apart from Christ. And sure, we might say, John, I, I think this becomes a mantra for us, John 15, 5, where it says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Notice he bears it, he doesn't produce it, he just gets to bear it, Say, well, look what God is doing. Can you believe this? I'm getting to bear much fruit. And then he adds this little tagline at the end, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Ooh, what do you mean, apart from you, I can do nothing? Yep, you're united with me, you can do all things in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In me, anything, apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and what happens is, until that really becomes the message of our heart, everywhere I go, apart from Christ, I mean, I can look and I can do some good stuff, but it's lifeless. It's without Him, so therefore it's lifeless, because only life comes from Him. Apart from me, because I, I learn to rest in it. Now, as I teach, as I go around, whether it's... Uh, I, I was doing some tile work the, this past week, and there was a bunch of teenagers there, and I had done youth pastoring before, so it wasn't a problem for me to talk to them. I had six different ways that I could chat with them about, about the cross. And I sat there and said, Lord, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, uh, you give me the words to say. You speak to my heart. I... I I can do some, some great little magic tricks for him even if you want. If you want me to do that, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to go through the different things I've learned, but really got apart from you, I don't know what to say to these kids. I don't know how to bring life and light to them. And that's, that's where humility comes, when we start to receive this verse, apart from me you can do nothing, and start to live out of that. And start, it, 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 what it does is it humbles the independent heart. And the other thing that it does is it raises up our true self. Because of in Him I can do all things. He's united Himself with me, so I can do all things. But yet apart from Him I can do nothing. So there's a humility that takes place when I realize it, that, I, that, that life never originated with me. Goodness never originated with me. Faith doesn't originate with me. My part is to believe what He says and then to walk that out. And to learn to do it in His strength and His power. But that becomes the mantra of our life when we realize it. Really, apart from him, we can do some good-looking things, as the Chinese missionary said, but they become lifeless. And that's why we have so many of these big, great churches that really it's hard to tell them from the world. Because they're trying to use the world's means to get people in so that at least somebody can hear the gospel message. And, and you know, maybe their motivation is right, but the means is wrong. The church is for the, for the bride of Christ. The church in and of itself is ecclesia. It means the called out ones. It's the place in Ephesians 4 where you guys come to be equipped, encouraged, and exhorted for the ministry. The ministry is outside of here. All right. So let's go on. In the past... In the last part, we really don't embrace too well because I still think that there's something that I can do for God. It doesn't have to be all of God and none of me. It hits at the heart of our self-worth, which is truly no worth apart from Christ. I mean, even the reality where we live and move and breathe, that can only happen in Christ. I can't, I, I can't produce my next breath. I'm that dependent upon God. But pride sets in and I begin to say, Oh, I'm not dependent. I got this. I've got this. I got this. When I, My next breath... I mean, that's why Craig's testimony is so good when losing a lung, or a half a lung, right? He, the whole thing, the whole thing. And, and it reminded his breathing. Apart from him, apart from Christ, I don't have my next breath. I have nothing I do to deserve it, nothing I do to merit it, nothing I do to con can produce my next breath. Only by the grace and beauty of God and the love of God, he gives it. And I receive it with thanksgiving. Because it's that, that, that lung association... Um, nothing is more, I can't remember the, the name of the, their mantra, but nothing is important when you can't breathe. Nothing else is important when you can't breathe. And that's the truth. If, if God was to dry up the air for all of us at this point, and we weren't able to take our next breath, you know, the, 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 if our shoes and belt match, didn't match that day, that, that becomes of little importance. <laughs> yes, I'm, I match my shoes and belt. That's the only reason I said it's not my wife that does it. <laughs> it's just a little pet peeve of mine. My belt doesn't match my shoes. All right, let's let's go back into the deep things of God now. Maybe, yeah, yeah, that's it's ADD for me. How many dimples on a golf ball now? All right. So, the truth is, is that God's created us each to be an individual, and to each to receive His life. And and here's the other thing: no one should be like me. 
Now you can follow me in what it means to live by faith and what that looks like, but God's created us each to be individual or each his, his unique workmanship. That word workmanship is poema, and it means poem. We're his unique poem. We're his unique expression of, of this Trinity family. And each given special gifts and talents to use out in his world. And we get to express that. I, I saw this online the other day. We're his workmanship. And poema, this is actually, a, a, I think, at an artist's house. It means a work brought forth by an artisan. So they didn't even know they are expressing the beauty of God. You're a work brought forth by the artisan of God. And you've been recreated. You've been created brand new. He's exchanged your old life for his life. That is what's happened. I mean, how boring would it be if all poems were the same? If all poems were roses are red, violets are blue? I mean, we get so sick of that. And, and what happens is we know that God wants unity in the body. And we begin to think, well, that must be uniformity. So I all, we all must be the special, specific way. The truth is, that's, God wants us to be united in our differences. Cultural differences. I mean, I, I don't know how God's given me this great love for a guy from Damascus, Syria. That is a dancer, and, I'm a, and I drive on a tractor a lot of times. It's the weirdest thing, but we have this unity of faith. And, and wherein we can love one another because of Christ in Him and Christ in me. And, and that, that is so much more excellent than this cookie-cutter Christianity. Now I get to see His gifts. And I, the other thing is, I get to enjoy His gifts. He he's, uh, trains people for dancing. So now my kids, when they come here, they enjoy the time of cleaning up. Because we put this music on. It's not music I'd have in the tractor, brother. I'd put some country in the tractor. I don't think I would have the Latin music in the tractor or whatever it is. But man, my kids enjoy it. And they're dancing, and then now he's got some new dance moves, which I should patent so you don't steal them from my three-year-old. But we get to be this unique expression. And now I get to enjoy the gifts that, that, that God has, has been placed into Suhad and to each of us. And I get to understand more of his background and understand more and, and, and enjoy these gifts together as a, as a family. And the world looks on and says, look at those guys. you got a guy from Damascus. you got a guy you know, from, from this area. you got a guy from this area. you got a guy that's poor. you got a guy that's rich. you got a, a guy that, 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 that looks this way and another person that looks that way. And yet they all live in the unity of the faith. They all live in this beautiful love relationship. And therein where the verse reminds us, they shall know... You're my disciples by how you look alike. No, but by the love that you have for one another. That's why it was such a big deal when the Greeks and the Jews got together and were living in the unity of the faith because the, 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 the Gentiles or the Greeks were called dogs. Right? The, and the Jews never collaborated or never connected with them. And now they got to have this unity of faith. All right, let me finish up here. So God desires us to be uniquely us. What are the dreams that you have? I think that one of the problems within Christianity is we think too much of ourself and too little of our God. And I, I mean that in two ways. We, we constantly think too much of ourself and too little of God. And we also do that ability-wise. We think too much of ourselves, our self-ability, and too little of His ability. I, I say we start dreaming bigger. We start thinking big thoughts. What is God truly desiring us to do? What, is, what does He want for us to do in this generation, in this time and space? And really press God. Because I think most of the stuff you, you'll see in committees, and, and, and I think we're already starting to be guilty of it here in this church, is stuff that we can control. Stuff that is, all right, well, we know by the book we can do these things. We really don't need God's help in there. And I really want to press into God. He's given me these dreams and desires. And I'm going to share some of those on the 15th. And, and what he's really doing in me. And maybe he's doing some of those same things in you. Let's talk about those things and let's say, okay, press God. Where do you, where do you want us to move? How do you want us to, to work these dreams out? For, for me, one of my dreams was to, to have this church. And there was a lot of obstacles that came in the way of it. I've always been self-sufficient, so now I had to rely on Christ's sufficiency for my needs, my daily needs, and my family's daily needs. That, that was stretching us in faith. And me going back to God saying, did you really? Are you sure you want me to do this? You sure you don't want me to get back into real estate? You don't want me to get into development again? Because I can handle that part. I know I can do well. Even though the real estate market's in the tank, I can still handle that part. No, no. And, and God gave me this specific 
word to my heart. You concentrate on the people. You love the people and take your eyes off the finances. I got that. Now that's now that's a lot harder to that's a lot easier to say than it is done. Because I've always concentrated on my finances. I've always kept the checkbook very well and made sure we had provision and we you know now I'm having to trust God to meet the needs of me. It's just different. I, I lost a job this, this earlier this week that was a four hundred dollar job. And that to, to me is a lot of money. And I'm teaching Wednesday and the funny thing is and I didn't know I had lost the job until Thursday. They just had rescheduled the job till next week. But the funny thing is I'm teaching on Wednesday and I say in there, if anybody just wants to give me money, go ahead and give me money. And I was using it as an example. If God leads you to give me money, you give me money. Now, I don't think anybody in Wednesday class has ever given me money. So I don't know why I even said that. The funny thing is God had already sent somebody there with $400 in cash to take care of the needs that we had for that week. And I sit back and I'm like, God, how come I go back and I want to grab a hold? I, I know I've given it to you, but I take it back from you and say, okay, I can handle this, God, because you can't. And I look at my lack of trust and I say, God, thank God you're first patient and kind with me. I know that you'll provide all of my family's needs. I mean, we got a pantry full of food. I don't even know why I'm questioning it. It's not like you know we're, we're, we're living on a shoestring. I mean, we've got a pantry full of food. We've got gas in the car. We're good to go. But this, this brother felt led to bring four $100 bills. And he didn't know I had lost that job. See, so he, he was only moving. And I asked him later on, I said, well, what made you do this? He said, I just felt the Spirit lead me to give you some money. And it was kind of an odd amount, too. It, it just, it, he never ceases to amaze me. He's always showing off. <laughs> so let me finalize, uh, let me finish it on this. And for the people on the video, they said, uh, they said, Dave, you always say, let me, let me finish on this, and you go another 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> let me finish on this last note, the last slide, too. So uh, <laughs> hopefully I can finish this. We're going back to the story of slavery and then the 13th Amendment ending slavery, the 14th Amendment giving blacks their rights, and then the system of penage, which happens for the next 80 years, where they're, they know they're free, but they're taken back under by the taskmaster to, to live as free slaves, which doesn't make any sense. If you think about the words, there's no such thing as a free slave. Okay. So now they're living as a free slave, yet still the white taskmaster is taking them to task. There was a guy, and he's one of my one of my greatest heroes, not only in what he's done in this country, he's a great hero, but if you read some of his stuff on the faith, it's it, it'll blow you away. The guy's name was Frederick Douglass. He was a slave, right? And he wasn't about to be just a slave. He was trying to run away and he'd take the beatings. In fact, he was brought into an inch of his life. There's a, a picture of him towards the end of his life. Now, if he would have believed the lie of Peenish, we would have missed a lot of the things that he had accomplished. Not for blacks, but for this country, for, for people. He accomplished great things for blacks, but he's accomplished even more for all people. And, and I, I mean, the problem is on this is I could have done multiple slides on all of the things that, 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 that he has fed into this country. But here's just a couple of highlights of his life, and I, I really isn't doing him justice. If you guys so feel led, go out and find us. But my point is, is if, if he would have been receiving the lie that he was still a slave, then he would have never had these accomplishments. So here's a couple of them. Born into slavery. At one point he had escaped. He was beaten within an inch of his life to break his will. Yet he still continued to be moving out of slavery. Finally got free and he authors a book on what slavery is like in the Deep South at the time. This moves the hearts of the people and really was, was one of the things that, that pressed us to, to have the 13th and 14th Amendment. This book was written in the 1840s. The Civil War was in the 1860s. So he was instrumental in helping others to be free in the Underground Railroad, bringing other people to freedom, being an ambassador of this freedom. <clears throat> During the Civil War... He was an advisor to Lincoln. Now that, that's, a, that's a huge thing. This is a black. Remember, blacks were 
not not accounted at that point. Thirteenth Amendment hadn't passed, but during the war, Lincoln saw this this man's great intellect and his ability, and he even put off governors and other people so that he could sit and talk with with Frederick Douglass about how to handle this war and how to to break through. Now, here's the part. The the last part I, I really find is cool with this guy, and again, I could talk twenty minutes easily about this guy because he's one of my heroes. But he helped to rebuild the South during Reconstruction. He had forgiven them for their for their evil. Forgiven them. It's not just not just him being a slave. You got to think his parents were his 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 great grandparents. Other people were slaves that were brought into this country, and then he helps to rebuild them during Reconstruction. He was the first black man to ever get a vote for president by a major party. Because there were other parties, small little parties, that, that voted. But at the Republican convention, he was the first one to ever get a vote for president of the United States. I think it was the 1868 convention. And, and so much more could be said about him. But my point is not about Frederick Douglass and all of his accomplishments. It's if the enemy would have stolen this man's life we would be less well off as a people. Now, don't let the enemy steal the life in you. Don't let the enemy steal these truths away from you. Walk in the reality of who you are. Even it may not feel right. We don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Feelings and sight, that's the same thing. We walk by faith. Okay, God, you said this is true. The fiery darts are coming. What, what, what armor does God give us to quench those fiery darts? A shield. What's the shield of? Faith. That's why it's so important to understand who we are. Because when those darts come, and they will, they'll begin to say, you're not that. You're this. You're not that. You're this. You can't really do that. I mean, God's not going to be there for you. Look, you're, you're living in this way. And it begins to get self focus and a Savior focus. The faith, the shield of faith says, no. God has equipped me, enabled me, and He's encouraging me to do all things in Christ for His glory and for the other people. Greatest love, greatest love. Oh, I've been set free.